Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders, Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, and Long Sight. You are the reason why this content remains average. And that word is appropriate for today. We are going to discuss something that I'm pretty sure was a recommendation that was actually meant to be a joke, but I am going to take it very seriously because we do worst trains ever, we do best trains ever, but what about trains that aren't really bad, but aren't really good either? They're just okay. They are average. Here's five of the most annoyingly average trains ever. O10 Zeros, sometimes called a decapod if you're in the UK. However, here in America, we actually call two 10 Zeros decapods, which is really confusing because A, regional variances for calling the same locomotive different things is always confusing, especially if they're speaking the same language, but deca means 10. So in the UK, it's referring to it having 10 driving wheels, and in America, it's still referring to it having 10 driving wheels, but plus two. The confusion might be because here in America, we never really used 0 10 zeros very much. We actually hated them. And even in the UK, they didn't use them very much. Why? Well, they had good tractive effort, but having 10 wheels in a rigid frame with no leading wheels at all meant that their stability was very questionable. They were at a higher risk for derailments as a result. And as is appropriate with being average, they weren't so bad that they were completely useless but they just weren't that great compared to other locomotives of different wheel arrangements. But just because America and the UK didn't use them very much doesn't necessarily mean they didn't see use elsewhere. Many countries actually gave them a chance. Austria introduced a type like this that had a surprisingly low axle load that was pretty successful in mountainous regions, and Russia adored them for whatever reason. They called them the E-Class, and they were the most numerous single class of locomotive in the world, with about 11,000 manufactured. Not just for Russia, but Czechoslovakia, Germany, Sweden, Hungary, and Poland used them. They weren't bad, but again they wound up being superseded by locomotives with actual leading wheels, like the L-Class, which were two 10 zeros, or the FD class, which were two 10 twos. Still, they weren't horrible, and they have seen a decent amount of preservation over the years. The Pennsylvania Railroad class Q2. I've been getting requests for the Q2. Sometimes people will say that it's one of the best locos ever. Sometimes people will say it's one of the worst. I'm gonna tell you up front, it isn't either. It's just fine. It's very fine. They were duplex steam locomotives with a weird wheel arrangement, 4464s, four, similar to the Q1s, but the Q2s basically took the Q1s and fixed all their problems. They were very, very, very powerful, and by some estimates, they'd be the largest non-articulated locomotives ever built, as well as the most powerful ever static tested. They produced 7,987 cylinder horsepower, and they were considered very successful, and they even had an innovation with an automatic slip control mechanism. Duplexes in general usually have a really bad knack for wheel slip, but the Q2s avoided it with the control mechanism. But why are they so average? They could pull freight trains very well and they were extremely powerful. Well, they were, but for one thing they couldn't outdo diesels, which like every steam engine they were superseded by diesels eventually. But the bigger issue that Pennsylvania Railroad had with them was that, yeah, they were incredibly powerful, but truth be told they were only slightly more capable than a conventional J1 class which were two 10 fours, with the main difference is that the Q2s were way, way, way more expensive. So yeah, they were powerful, but economically, they really weren't feasible. In realistic terms, when you consider overall usefulness, they're just kinda, eh, yeah, they'll get the job done, but you'll be paying a lot of money in order to do it. The EMD GP39. Built as a derivative to the successful GP38s that EMD also produced, GP39 was meant to be the next step in their evolution. So what was the big deal? What made them so unique? Well, when they were constructed between 1969 and 1970, EMD added a breakthrough mechanism. Oh yeah. See, the GP38s were equipped with a 16-cylinder engine that generated 2,000 horsepower, but the GP39s 
were equipped with a 12-cylinder engine, which, because they turbocharged it, generated 2,300 horsepower. Ooh, very exciting. And that was kind of their issue. Turbocharging engines can work, but it can be very hit or miss in terms of reliability. That really wasn't the GP39's problem. It was just that the GP38 was so successful, most American railroads really didn't see a need to get the GP39s. What would the point be? The 12-cylinder engine may be a little more fuel efficient, sure, but it would only give them an extra 300 horsepower. They weren't that much more capable than the 38s. A lot of the railroads were struggling financially back then, and the notion of investing in a new type of diesel that really wasn't that much better than the previous entry just didn't make any sense. They only ever made 23 of them, 20 of which went to the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, two went to Kennecott Copper, and one more went to Atlanta and St. Andrews Bay. Some of them are still in service now, as again, they weren't necessarily bad, it was just as far as the buyers were concerned, they were just a little bit pointless. The British Rail Class 52. <laughs> Why? Why must you make me suffer like this? <laughs> My torture is endless. There is no end in sight. There is only the unicycle lion. Now the Class 52s are generally considered pretty good all-around locomotives, especially when you take into account the fact that they were built during the modernization plan. 30 of them were built by Swindon Works, and 44 were built by Crew. The thing about the Class 52s was this. They're diesel hydraulic, like the teddy bears, actually. And the thing was, British Railways really didn't want diesel hydraulic. They were pushing for a standard of diesel electric. However, their western region, which should have been subservient to the overall will of British Railways, was pretty rebellious, and really seemed to hate just being told what to do, especially when it came to what type of diesels they were going to use. The western region really preferred diesel hydraulics, and the vast majority of the hydraulics that were produced went to the western region. Now, eventually British Railways did crack down on them and force them into using diesel electrics, but not before the Class 52 got to serve for a pretty decent amount of time. Given the fact they were non-standard, they actually produced quite a bit, 74 in total. They're also known as Westerns, or Wizzos, or Thousands. Depending on which rail fan you ask, I presume. They were relatively reliable overall, and they lasted until 1977. But this is a list of average, and despite the fact the Class 52s, compared to a lot of the horrible diesels that was under British Rail at that time, was better, they weren't necessarily the best. Being non-standard is one thing, but I personally would overlook that as long as it worked. Thing was, they had a continuous problem due to a mismatch between the Maybach MD655 engines and the Voith L630 RV3 speed hydraulic transmissions. The top gear ratio of the transmission was too high for the torque characteristics of the engine. This caused the locomotives to struggle to reach their claimed 90 miles per hour top speed, a factor that was made even worse if they weren't given regular maintenance. Certain tests were conducted in the late 60s to really figure out how much horsepower the Class 52s had. They were put up against other locomotives that were diesel electric, like the Class 46s and the Class 47s, and the result was that the 52 wasn't bad, but it wasn't as good as a lot of the mainline diesels that British Rail was already using, which really solidified British Rail's point that everyone should be using diesel electrics, not diesel hydraulics. Fortunately, when they were withdrawn, seven managed to survive in the preservation, a handful of which are actually in running condition. So like I said, they're not at all bad, but they're a little bit flawed compared to some of their diesel electric cousins that they were competing against. The Alco PA. Alco, much like Baldwin, really struggled to figure out how to design diesels very well. During the age of steam, Alco and Baldwin were top tier in terms of producing quality rolling stock. But when EMD came in with the diesels, all that changed. The two struggled to keep up, and eventually they would fail. But they gave it a good try, and some of what they produced wasn't necessarily bad. And the PAs were an example of a good try by Alco. Some consider them one of the most beautiful diesels ever created, and that will be debated in the comments, I'm sure. However, the railways liked them a little less. The problem with them wasn't so much that they were necessarily bad, but they were more unreliable than their EMD counterparts. Since EMD was the big competitor in this situation, Alco could not afford to produce a diesel that was inferior to theirs. Yet the PAs, frankly, in terms of operation, 
were. They still are a popular type of locomotive despite that problem, and a handful did manage to survive into preservation. Three are considered preserved, there are two being restored right now, and one was converted to a steam generator car. So I don't know if that counts as preserved, but that's a fact. Every other one was sadly scrapped. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.